microphone in my way, but there's obviously a lot to think about, and um, probably most people won't think about it. So what exactly is on my, on my mind today? What exactly am I thinking today? Why am I doing this? Why Prometheus? It made a stir months ago. What, what's the importance now? Why would it be important now if it was... Uh, not really that important. Um, I mean, it was important, but it wasn't that important. It was just another hybrid movie um, suggesting that, of course, our progenitors are uh, these other beings who then, and no one's told you, but I mean, basically what it is is they made humans, uh, you know, using the DNA and uh, seeded humans really, and then ultimately wanted to destroy them. Possibly it was a competition thing, and they were giants. And then there's other symbolism, like the evil thing in there. There's a serpent, and there's like a octopus squid liking kind of thing that uh, devours. E these aliens were all, or if you will, these beings that were our progenitors who don't really speak. You know, they, they have high technology, but basically they're... Um, what could I say about it? I had seen the, the film, you know, Prometheus by Ridley Scott last night. And I'd been waiting to say something about uh, DNA. And I've been definitely waiting for an answer regarding these various ships and regarding one that I will be dealing with. And I understand that this territory, see the, the problem is, is that Christianity is, there's all this control. I mean, it, ex it exerts control, of, the whole point seems to me to be to can exert control over others. You know, don't see that film. Don't go there. Don't do this. Don't do that because it's it's evil. It's it's bad. It, it it'll it'll hurt you. Uh, it will do great harm, and, and 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 the demons will get you. Don't go to Hollywood movies. Don't look at this. Don't look at that. The demons might jump in. Um, so, I didn't see Prometheus because people told me and warned me that um, though I love Ridley Scott's artwork and his, you know, his directing is superb uh, because it's blasphemous against Jesus. Nothing could be further from the truth. Once again, burned by Christians. And I am so angry with myself for not for saying, well, okay, one more time, I'll trust. One more time, yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't trust them as far as I can throw them. And that's just too bad. But I mean, the bottom line is, it's a convoluted film, not a great film. Lots of, if you like sci-fi, it's a good film. But the point is, it's, it's, to, it's posing the question, what if we were seated here and uh, through DNA um, getting out and into... Uh, um, uh, breaking apart in the ocean, and then maybe we came out of the ocean or some kind of thing, whatever. We were seated on Earth, and, um, and there's a lot of symbolism in the film. Like, it's almost like an art film with action that deals with the serpent, deals with Jesus. Uh, the whole thing takes place on Christmas, and <laughs> that's when it starts. And, you know, they want to find the progenitors 
you know, finding the, the caves, all the similarities and hieroglyphics and all the similar artwork throughout all the ancients that had no contact with each other, which we've known. We've also seen pictures of aliens flying, aliens, you know, pictures of human, human beings, human looking beings flying around in craft. Uh, the, the whole thing about the, the great star, Jesus possibly being one of these engineers, they call them the engineers who engineer the, uh, the universe, they engineer things, they engineer life. But they happen to be just really evil. You know, they, 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 the first thing they want to do is kill humans. So they search all this way, you know, this, uh, the, the protagonist and, you know, this group of people takes off on a ship called Prometheus and they go all this way, all these light years away. And uh, they want to ask a question, you know, why did you make us? You know, what are we here for? What is our purpose? What are we doing? What is this? And um, so when they get to the point of asking the question of uh, this one being is left alive, there's one left in this, you know, pyramid with their, where they're terraforming. And they ask him, you know, they, they, they just want to ask a question. This old man who's funded the whole thing, he wants more life. He, he's really basic. He just wants to extend the life. If you look at all the symbols and, and uh, you look at what I've talked about before, which is that what's the goal? They ultimately want to download themselves into vessels that will not age and so they will not die. I mean, that's numero uno. And they want to re-terraform the planet, this planet Earth to make it conducive to that new form of life that they anticipate having. And they want to re-engineer everything so that they can have this um, go off to the stars or go wherever they want in their craft and not have to worry about aging or anything else, but be able to just be eternally free. And this is the promise of Christ, of course. Now, the, the woman protagonist, I forget her name, Dr. Shaw, she has a, a, a crucifix, and they keep trying to take it away from her and ask her, have you lost your faith? Have you lost your faith? Now that you know that you were seated, have you lost your faith? Have you lost your faith? And then the question is begged, yeah, but who made them? <laughs> and who made all the universe? <laughs> so far from being blasphemous, the question is never answered. Oh, these guys seated us here, therefore Jesus is invalid. No, therefore Jesus may be one of them. Or maybe not. Um, you had the UFO in the sky, the big, the big star. You had the uh, th these uh, people from other religions, Persians possibly, coming to um, see the baby Jesus. Uh, he would be the Messiah. He would be the key. Um, not necessarily a genetic key, but he would be the key. And the whole movie centered around whether you're going to have faith in Jesus or whether the alien issue. If this, if you were seated, would that break your faith? And that's basically what the whole movie is about. It just poses that one question. The answer is no. With the lead protagonist, it did not break her faith. She did not lose her faith. She was searching for an answer as to why she is born. And the account in Genesis that God did this and God did that, um, God being a spirit, uh, people think that he's like a physical being. No, but he creates things that do also create other things. I mean, it... You know, the whole universe is teeming with life in that way, and everything is an agent of God in the sense that his will goes forth and no other will goes forth. So it didn't conflict with my faith, didn't make me lose my faith. It, it just it made me remember my own need to understand why I was somewhere else and then I'm here. And here seems to be just stupidity, Suffering, needless suffering, wasting of resources, wasted, corrupt, stupid people. And I said, what, what in the world are you showing me, Lord? Why in the world would you send me here? So I want a meeting with these. And then I've, I have in mind, you know, this ship outside with these beings in it. And we're going to have a little talk. And no, they're not evil. These are like what you might call angels. And then there's, you know, then there's another side of fallen angels or dark angels or, you know, ones that don't have our best interest at heart, put it that way. And the whole thing seems to be, you know, ultimately centering around. And even this movie, as much as it tried to get away from, it's still centered around Jesus. The whole movie centers around, you know, but who made them? And, you know, why are they able to manipulate the universe? To me, they were like, you know, kind of like a... Uh, 
almost like a fallen angel type creature. Um, you know, they could manipulate all the planets and they could do lots of things. I mean, they couldn't get rid of the solar system, but they had, you know, like masters of the universe capabilities. Um, DNA was at the center of it. DNA being, you know, God making DNA, DNA, the strand that gives all life everywhere has DNA. They go, well, we're a perfect match. And you know what? We're very similar to other things too. We're a near perfect match to a lot of beings that are different than us. So that proves nothing either. And um, anyway, I just put that prelude there because it's out on video. And I got it a while back on video, but it's out now on video. And I usually wait to review things on video. And, and uh, you know, this I was not disappointed. I love the filmmaking. And the story was convoluted. But I'm, I'm one of these people that when it comes to sci-fi, you can... <laughs> You can basically be all over the map. And if it's sci-fi and if it's got spaceships in it and we're going to other planets, I'm very forgiving. <laughs> you know, I'm very forgiving because like Ridley Scott, I have a lot of questions too. Like, why am I here when I remember being there? And why am I here when I remember when I see myself now being there, but no access back to where I was? And this has plagued me my whole life because I wasn't really meant for this planet and not the kind of person that would come here, you know. The kind of people that come here are people that, you know, they get along. They, they you know, they, they get to the world and they, they understand it and it's kind of like when in Rome and they're able to adapt. And to them, it's not corruption. It's just basic uh, relating to, to them, it's very natural. But to me, I feel like, probably like you feel, a stranger in a strange land completely. And um, my closest brethren aren't even human. I mean, they're over there, right? Hello. And uh, that's weird. Like I must be an alien. And further to that, we have the serpent. Now, the serpent in the story, Prometheus... These are evil. There's these, like little serpent and there's big giant serpents. And there's like Leviathan type creatures, you know, that, that basically what happened is these things, they, they made them from the DNA and then they wiped out the whole population of these beings that were our, called the engineers, which are our progenitors, which are these kind of amorphous. They almost, they kind of remind me of the angels in um, another religious movie, The Knowing with Nicolas Cage. Kind of similar, but they were giants. So they brought the Nephilim feature in. They brought the hybridization feature in. And in terms of creating human, it wasn't done directly. It was a mistake. Not a mistake. It was a matter of a guy imploding himself or exploding himself, his DNA going into the water, and then these different various creatures coming forth or humans coming forth from that. And uh, in other words, seeded, but not engineered, let's say. So the, I, the name engineer is a little bit of a misnomer. And that's kind of, you know, you may have a different take on it, a different perception on it. Um, no, but just to go against the sort of Christian ethos, I don't think there's anything that I couldn't see. That I'm not afraid, if I look at this movie and I see Ridley Scott flailing around trying to find an answer to something and trying to, I don't think he's trying to put something forth so much as he's trying to pose a question with this film and or questions. And um, I don't think my exposure to that or anything is going to demonize me. I'm still stuck with me. I see demonized people. I've dealt with them several times. There's a Christian demon type person. There's a there's a kind of a leftist Marxist kind of, you know, I, it's, it's sort of it's a corrupt state of being. And we've had similar demons in different people coming here, you know, to do work and, you know, and they start messing things up. Like one guy had, he was supposed to just paint the windows and he took the screens. He ended up breaking all the windows. It cost thousands of dollars to actually replace them in the name of fixing them and in the name of being careful and in the name of going for, and he just he, he couldn't help, and it was inexplicable, the, the, just the amount of damage that was done. And uh, we had other people like that, too, with that same spirit, three so far. And there was a demon in them, and this, it's the same demon in them. And so I understand that. Um, 
And I suppose we could just say, well, eventually, you know, if you don't look at it as a demon, you could say, well, it's the same personality trait. When they get around people like us, they manifest in the sense of if they're working, they are, as they're fixing something, they're breaking something. And they think they're fixing it and unaware that they're breaking it. And if you point it out to them, they feel like you're picking on them. Do you know, it's not just passive aggressive. There's this thing there. But, uh, and I, from time to time, I've seen movies and been influenced and seen plays and read books. And um, I never understood the book burning or the CD burning of the Beatles. You know, I mean, the Beatles are what they're, I could listen to the Beatles all day long. It's not going to affect me. I'm not going to just suddenly get on the bandwagon. You could play it all day long, like as a torture device to, to try to get me to go along with that great thing. And it just won't happen. I will. I don't resist the music. I, I think the music's fine, but I'm not going to take it to heart. In other words, I'm not going to be like Paul McCartney or the originators of the music of the Beatles. It's just not going to happen because we have two different cultures. We're two different species, pretty much two different ways of thinking, two different ways of life. And we're incompatible. You know, I knew that at an early age. It didn't stop me from liking the music. I liked it, but it didn't, you know, did not take it hard. I'm really much more um, prone to like music that is, uh, how should I put it? Um, Not so arrogant. Not so assuming. Not so evangelistic, not so didactic, not so um, preachy as the Beatles or the Stones or the whatever were and, 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 and the rest of them from that era. You know, this, this coming over here and the whole, you know, Marxist communist plot and the music and all that to be preaching, evangelizing, mind controlling people to get ready for this revolution. And now the revolution looks and appears to be something not demonic, but it's something of a higher order, something organized by fallen angels, by watchers, by aliens, something about to happen to the earth. Something is why all these movies of, you know, Avatar and this one and and, uh, Thor and others dealing with DNA and dealing with hybrids and who are going to save the world and um, you know, gods from above, they're giants, they, they require worship, they're coming back, the, the Zachariah Sitchin material about the, the Anunnaki and, and, the, and then the Bible about the Nephilim, and then all the people who are t- doing all the talking about, um, uh, you know, all these different uh, aspects, and, you know, all kind of saying the same thing, and then you look at... Uh, the idea of birthing a new species or creating a third strand of DNA, creating a third kind of species, creating the final ultimate super species, paralleling with the Bibles, you will be in a glorified body that is incorruptible. That's the goal of the, um, of the elites on the earth, to have an incorruptible body. And that's what they're working on fur- f- furiously. And at the same time, it's exactly the goal of the, the movie, this movie, the guy that funded this whole Prometheus project. Uh, his goal was to live. He was an old man. He's going to die. And he wanted them to engineer him so he could live. He wanted to find that answer. <laughs> as soon as the guy met the, the big alien or well, who wouldn't be an alien, but the original you know, uh, being, the guy killed him. You know, and uh, just like I came to ask this question, what about eternal life? And the guy just backhanded him and that was the end of him. (laughs) The whole movie ended up with, you know, just anticlimactic in that way. There was no big secret. There was no secret love. You're going to enter this chamber and all the angels are going to sing. And finally, you're in the presence of all that is and the almighty. And he just happens to be all for all your desires, like a big uh, wish making machine, like a big genie. And you're going to go to the stars and live forever. And no, in the end of the movie, they were all having and I'm sure there'll be a Prometheus one, two, three, whatever. There maybe won't be a Ridley Scott film, but I, I don't think they're going to give up on the series because, you see, this meme that they're pushing, this this need, is really within all of us. And then, of course, to deflect that need, the television and everything else is getting us into politics and, you know, the, the basic necessities of life keep us from wondering, well, who am I? 
why did Lord God, if you made me, why did you make me? Why am I suffering? What am I supposed to be if I'm getting old and tired and I'm going to die? What was the point of this when I can't even remember what I did when I was younger? Why? 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 Why indeed? Why indeed? That's the question of the ages. That's the question every, every religion is founded upon that simple thing. Who were the uh, Sumerians? Who were the Egyptians? Why are there UFOs and airplanes and ancient um, art and artifacts and hieroglyphs? Why is there this thing that Jonathan Clack uh, 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 overturned that you turn things upside down, you see there's a, some plot that the hu human DNA was somehow corrupted and that's really the fall of man? And if that's really true, who are the people doing the corrupting? And let's call them people. I'm, I'm not going to call them aliens because they're not aliens. They're, we're related. So what's, what gives? What's the purpose of the genetically manipulated human or fallen human what do they get out of enslaving us on this planet if that's really what's going on? And I don't get any answer back to you. That reminds me of the Moody Blues song, Why Do We Never Get an Answer When We're Knocking at the Door? <laughs> I mean, okay, yeah, like, like a good question that was posed in that song was, why is there war and hate and death? Why? Why? Why is there constant suffering everywhere on the planet? Why? What is the purpose of that? If you're God and almighty and everything, why don't you just end it? Why? And the Christian church doesn't want you to ask those questions because when I asked them in the church, they threw me out. All of them. So I'm waiting on my friends to talk to me. That's right. I'm waiting on my friends to talk to me because they're more real than a lot of the stuff that goes on on Earth, which is like living in a menagerie, living at Disneyland, which I've said a million times before, but I mean, it really is true. Avatar, connected to the great tree, connected to the divine mother and all beings will live in harmony. No, there were warriors in Avatar, so obviously there were wars before. Or we could be like the Indians connected to nature. Well, before the white man got to the American continent, the brown Indians, for those making a deal out of race, were attacking each other all over the place uh, over what? Territory. And so they were killing each other. And they were scalping each other. And then the white man came. And then they were, you know, going at it. And then they conquered. And then there were reservations. And now, what? It's going to be Obama who's going to put an end to the, uh, to the European culture in America or to the white man's culture in America, whatever it is. It's the clash of civilizations, which gets us no closer to, I think, the main thing that they don't want is for you to ask these questions. Now, is Ridley Scott saying in the movie that uh, Jesus is an alien? Jesus is an engineer. He's an advanced being. But if that's the case, being in Christ doesn't require seeding or science. It requires simply faith, and one is made a new creature in Christ. But look at the terminology, new creature. New creature, understand? New creature. Um. A new, that's what they're talking about, a new creation, something new. And then a glorified body, not being bound and tethered here, but more like what I would consider to be, um, you know, a, a body capable of, uh, you know, a, a, a personality within a, 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 a level of being that has autonomy. but then always subject to the Father's will, meaning, you know, his story is going to be the one that's told. And his beings are going to be the ones that act in the story because he's not an actor. Have you ever noticed that? He's a spirit, has to be worshipped in spirit and truth, is what the Bible says. So, you know, he's going to be a spirit. He's not going to be a, um, you know, an actor. He's going to create the actors to do his bidding. So when it says he did this and he did that to create the earth, he's not a being doing it. 
he's creating whatever is necessary to do whatever it is he needs to do, whether it's animate or inanimate. So now, when you think like that, what happens? Well, all these theories don't cancel each other out. In other words, it's all valid. Man still wants to overcome death, which, of course, they say, you're doing that in Christ, sit down and shut up. No, I will not sit down and shut up. That's not good enough for me. And I am uh, not going to die anyway. And I don't know how I know that, but I know that. So the church is just as corrupt as the, the movies that they prophesy against and the records and all the, they, they're right. Uh, yeah, those are satanic and, you know, there's satanic images in this thing, but it's uh, certainly not evil. It's gross at times. All the things that they warned me about turned out not to be true. Warning me about staying away from the world's movies and the world's this and that turned out not to be true. Warning me not to vote in the election because it's blasphemy voting for, you know, it's one person or a Buddhist or a Scientologist or a Mormon or an atheist or a Christian or any of them. They're all in the same category. They're all just, you know, whatever. It just, it doesn't matter to me. It didn't come up that way. It didn't come up through your rules. It didn't come up through your church. It didn't come up through any of that. I, I have no capability of being obedient to the church in any capacity anyway, whether it's the Catholic church, the Protestant church, I don't care what church it is, or political party or whatever. I will never be completely obedient in anything. And I won't take what you say for granted and say, okay, fine, I'll stay away from that because you say it's, we might get demonized. I mean, I know that... Um, you know, in the way back machine when I've taken drugs and not slept, and then I could start seeing into the other world. I could see there were other worlds there and demons, and, you know, and yeah, I was under assault, and I learned not to do that. That's a pretty good thing to learn, right? And I saw the flesh of bondage and then wanting to do things in the flesh and being, being a slave to the flesh and a slave to these fleshly desires, and I, I learned you got to find a way to resist it. you got to keep trying to overcome it. Yes, and the Bible's very clear on that. Unfortunately, the church doesn't do what it says. It doesn't try to overcome the flesh. It says you're just saved in Jesus, so it's all cool, or you can go to confession or whatever, and you're fine. So I think this science fiction inquiry of Ridley Scott, being a religious inquiry or spiritual inquiry, is definitely valid. And definitely is not harmful to Christians. If anything, it'd get a good discussion going. Oh, I know, that's forbidden. I know, oh, God forbid we should ever, you know, instead of just preaching at each other and laying on scripture and judging and condemning and putting each other in hell, wouldn't that be something if we had a, a discussion? We could go to Starbucks, <laughs> where the witch is, <laughs> and we could have a discussion about, about why we exist. And in this way, I find if we could get beyond the prejudices and the demons and all the stuff that possess everyone, everyone's got some kind of de demon thing going on. If you have bondage to any kind of sin at all, you have a demon. And you can scream and yell at that demon all day long and go to the, all the deliverance ministries and do all that stuff. And, you know, you're still going to be in the same place you are five years from now. You're gonna, you got a thorn in your side and, you know, you might have to contend with that for your whole life. That damn pattern you hate. And I'm here to tell you, don't beat yourself up over it. Just do the best you can. That's all anyone expects you to do. At least you know it's wrong, right? And as far as being judgmental, be judgmental. Be very judgmental. Be extremely judgmental about everything. Because letting the wrong spirit in can really set you back worse than drinking, you know, a fifth of gin every day. You know what I'm saying? It's really true. And then watch out, you people that are doing podcasts, watch out for blackmailers, you know, women seductresses that will come along and, you know, try to get you into some kind of a sex thing through Skype or something. And the next thing you know, you'd, you're, you've been videotaped and they're blackmailing you to say certain things or to shut up altogether. All that's going on, this whole war, and it's all centering around Jesus. So I got to go to Jesus. Jesus, what's going on? 
there will be, there's angels and there's Jesus and he is the King of King and Lord of Lords. And he is the final authority in all things, but he's very, the mystery revealed now is he's very much on top of this whole thing of the interdimensional cosmic UFO kind of thing. He's completely in chart. He's got it under control. Because there's craft on the angel side that you would call craft or whatever, beings and and fallen angels and different beings and there's creatures and there's all kinds of different things out there. And um, even the throne of God is said to be like a UFO. It travels around, you know. And um, there's all kind of parallel deceptions going on where, where there's the mirror image of, of the thing of God is really demonic. And there's all those things to discern, but you know, the way I do it is if it feels bad, I tend to want to get away from it because I trust those feelings. I feel that's God warning me. And if it feels good, I learn to question and try those spirits as, as John said, you know, try the spirits because not every spirit is from God, but at the same time, I don't let anyone in. It's not like I got to try the spirits because someone might get in and influence me. I don't let them in. I don't let them in. I've gotten to the point now where I just basically am shut off. I don't want to hear it. I've heard it all. I'm tired of hearing it. The answers I want can't be answered by humans. So I don't have any interest in asking humans anything. That being said, I... The people in the film, Ridley Scott and whatnot, asking the question of how were we created and what do our creators think of us and what's the purpose and all that, I think that's extremely valid. And I think everyone has that question. I think that's a, that might be the one question that brings us together as humanity. Anyway, all the sturm and drang about hell and... I don't even... You know, I'm just... I just... I just I don't want to mislead you because there are consequences to actions. You do reap what you sow. The prophets were real. The uh, witchcraft was real. Like I told you before, without, without the power of Christ, you, you can't. And I told people, don't, you don't run after witches. They have powers you don't have. They could beat the crap out of you. Yeah, but I'm in Christ. I can rebuke them. <laughs> uh, did God tell you to be stupid? Just walk on the other side of the street. You know, avoid, I've got, you know, I understand people make their choices. They could become witches, witchcraft, occult, and then the ways of the world, the ways of the earth, Satan, being agents of Satan, the kings and queens and presidents and secret societies and all that that stem from all of this. Um, has to do with multiplicity. In other words, there's a whole realm of that which cannot ascend. So they are obsessed with ascending. You, on the other hand, can go to and fro and ascend any day you like. So they're, they're freaked out by you. They don't understand why you exist. So they know it's Jesus because, you know, every UFO story in the world says, oh, you know about Jesus? It was fake. That crucifixion, all that was fake. Well, they the, the, the crucifixion is as much a legal matter as anything else. And in, in other words, it gives you a car to get out of jail. And this is jail. This is awful. That being said, there are things out there that are coming into the earth that are both good and evil and supernatural and to the point where it'll make people worship one way or the other. People want those answers. Why, 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 why so cruel to leave us here? And that, my friends, is a very legitimate question. Why indeed would they leave us here? Why indeed would they corrupt us and then disappear into some you know, you don't see them around at the corner and then there are rumors about Nephilim creatures walking around and why did they create them? Why did God say to destroy them? Why isn't God stomping their guts out right now? 
Or why aren't we empowered? Why are we helpless and can't do anything about it? Why have all our prayers against Satan and the Nephilim gone unheard? To now, anyway. Why must we contend with so much corruption and backwardsness that we start laughing at the stupidity of them and it all? You know, it's to the point where I just feel like telling the, you know, the president of the United States, I do not respect you, little boy. You are not a serious man. You are a coddled little joke and not welcome in my place of residence or anywhere around me. Because um, we all know what your game is and all you do is play games. But then again, let's multiply that to most of the Congress, most of the sciences. And all these people playing this game thinking they're fooling somebody, it's just unbelievable. They're not fooling anyone. But to be um, to have a leader that is an absolute fool is, um, you know, and I guess Bush was a fool too. Shoot. Reagan was controlled by a cultist Nancy. <laughs> Clinton was totally demonized, 100%. The libido demon. So was Kennedy, same they both had a similar kind of demon going on there. And then we go back, um, you know, to the time of Eisenhower, Nixon, Carter. Has there been any one of them worthy of respect? Or is it as the axiom that I put forth is you don't get to be president unless you're worthy of disrespect. And then then you're elected the, the, the most disrespectful one or the most dirty, evil one ends up kind of getting there. But then once he's there, he must do what he is told. I mean, that's a only I could come to that conclusion by looking into the spirit of a thing behind the scenes, behind closed doors in the spirit, which I'm capable of doing. And then when the Lord shows me all this, I go, my God, these are your average Joe out there worthy of is worthy of respect. Uh, heck, yeah. But the leader of the town and, and, and the state and the nation isn't. Why is that, Lord? Back to Ezekiel. Back to Ezekiel. You know, I don't have that right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of in, I just wanted to really do this Prometheus thing. And then since it's out on DVD and, and um, I just want to, you know, recommend it to you because I think it, it will get a discussion going about faith, especially with those that really dig the movie and they don't really understand that it's a religious quest. In the end, the woman, the protagonist, Dr. Shaw, played by Numi Rapace. Numi Rapace was the, the, the original girl in the dragon tattoo from Sweden. I don't know if you recall this. I only saw the Swedish movie. I, I love the girl with the dragon tattoo and the American version because I really love the music. But the Swedish version to me was more powerful. You know what I mean? And it, usually the original movie is. Anyway, she was terrific as uh, Dr. Shaw and uh, really great, really great physical actress. You know, it's wor worth uh, the, the view just to see her in action because she's just one of those very natural, just something you don't see in America too often because she's Swedish, so you don't see that. Anyway, Numi Rapace is um, Dr. Shaw, and in the end, there's a robot guy that <laughs> he... Uh, he looks just like a person. He's made himself look like Lawrence of Arabia because he really likes the movie Lawrence of Arabia, which he keeps screening for himself in Cinerama, which is another symbol that Ridley Scott is leaving us. The days of Cinerama he longs for, but that then hearkens Stanley Kubrick, and Stanley Kubrick was dealing with this same issue in 2001. There's nothing new. All these movies coming out, you, people are avoiding going to the real source, which is 2001. Stanley Kubrick... Stanley Kubrick, um, my favorite film director of, of all time. And, I, of course, I love David Lean, too, who directed um, Lawrence of Arabia. Everyone liked that. Back in the day, there were uh, Cinerama movie theaters. They thought this would be a big medium. And I'll tell you, this was a heck of a medium. This was amazing. The screen would wrap around the audience. So that when you were sitting there, and I remember the first time uh, I saw the first Cinerama movie ever screened because my, my father had insured the uh, Pacific theaters or whatever 
out on the West Coast. And so he had a pass, you know, to go to these movies. And I would always beg him to go, you know. So uh, that was probably the closest my father and I ever were. We're, you know, going to move. We both love movies. And uh, so that was like a, a way of communicating. And um, anyway, he was talking about Cinerama and he was all excited about it. And um, so he took me to the Cinerama Dome of when it was just first built in L.A. on Sunset Boulevard. Now, it's there now, but it screens regular movies. And you go in, and the first thing we saw was a movie with a roller coaster in it to show what Cinerama could do. Okay? It was like kind of like a, um, a promotion of Cinerama. And so you were, you were literally in the... Uh, do you remember that? Any old-timers? You were in the... Uh, so you got in the, uh, the cart, you know, you're right in the very front of the roller coaster uh, train, okay? You're right in the front cart, right? And it goes up and up and up. And when it went down, I was scared. To, to, you felt like you were going to throw up. It was so real because you were surrounded with the screen. The screen would go up the sides of the theater. So you were sitting in the middle, and it's going literally by you. It's almost like, I guess, what they're trying to do with 3D now, but it was never the same. Well... Stanley Kubrick's 2001 was originally screened in Cinerama. And that is why I believe that Ridley Scott had a Cinerama movie theater on the set in this movie Prometheus. Further to that, um, there's all kinds of other symbolism and other, the, the movie itself dealing with the, the nature of life and being seated. That was the exact theme of 2001, that we were seated here. And the symbol for being seated here was a giant monolith sometimes floating in space and showing how and showing how it intervened in some way this big monolith was intervening with the apes to make them more like to the point of being human and then it kind of went all full circle back to the whole nature of life but it was very expressionistic and artistic attempt to understand what is the nature of life and i think kubrick knew some things from secret societies and from NASA and whatnot, he was trying to convey that during 2001 that, you know, you might be made here by, it may not be the hand of God making you. And he, and he did a, a masterful work and it was screened in Cinerama. It was shot to be, I believe it was shot in 70 millimeter, double 35 millimeter, shot in 70 millimeter to be screened in Cinerama because you need a big negative, you know, to be able to make a print that can be that high a resolution that you would feel like you're literally in the movie. So here we have Lawrence of Arabia, also which screened in Cinerama, I believe. There's a few movies, but 2001, yeah, you, you know, how old was I, about 16, 15? You know, I hate to say it, but back in those days when I was 15, we were dropping acid, you know, dropping acid and going to see 2001 because why all the kids back then and the hippie thing was going on and Sunset Boulevard and the Strip and... Why were they taking mescaline and acid and those things? Because it made people, they wanted a cosmic experience. They wanted an answer to this question. Otherwise, you know, mescaline and LSD and psilocybin and all those kind of things, they're not fun. It's a hassle, you know? It's not like popping a, a you know, a pain pill and, and slamming a couple shots of whiskey or something and going, ah, pain's over with. You know, no, I'm, I'm, I'm stoned now, cool. No, it's um, it's a head trip and smoking hashish and doing it all at the same time. And, you know, it's all about, and then 2001, they were going to, to have cosmic consciousness, to have enlightenment, to get an answer. Of course, that was all lost in the whole commie thing and the music thing and whatever. But the bottom line is, back in that day, the Kubrick film was the same thing as Avatar, as all these films today. But Kubrick was in a strange position back then. And, of course, Ridley Scott, not just paying homage to him, but Ridley Scott saying in the beginning of the film, I am doing the same thing Stanley Kubrick was doing. That's what he was saying. I'm going to do it my own way, but I got the same question. I got the same thing I might try to say. So there we have... Um, you know, quite a, and then Alex Jones, I guess, on that little clip we had of him, he believes that the Illuminati is trying to give us messages that we're 
uh, in the plans of the Illuminati, folks, they have no plans for you except for you to be dead. There is no plan for you to go off to the stars and become a hybrid or whatever. They, you can volunteer for it all you like, but they're, they, use, they go with bloodlines. So they're, you know, they're terraforming the earth. It's just preparation of getting rid of what? You. Why can't they? There's some kind of restraining hand. What's that hand? That's my father. They can't beat him. I don't just believe that. I know that that's true. And the only place I can go to get, you know, I mean, he was the one that told me about this, these beings and this, you know, the, the angels, you know, just call them angels. And uh, eventually us having a little meeting. <laughs> I'm going to have a meeting. And I have a feeling that when I get the answers, it's just going to be like another grade of confusion. In other words, here's the answer. Yep, here's all the things that are happening. And here's what we're looking at from our perspective. And it's like, oh, then there's nothing I can say. Just believe. But that's not good enough for me right now. See, I, you know, you, you mature to the point where you need, you know, you remember being there, so you want to go back there. You know. Yeah, my my experience is not universal, so it's uh, useless for me to talk about it. Anyway, um, it's not part of the human yearning for the the thing. I guess it's you know it's part of it, but it's 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 you know it's a little different than that. In that there's something to do or something that's being done right now by me, but I'm not in that body doing it, but it's going on and it's just, you know, driving me nuts. Oh, no, 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 I'm not disturbed. I don't need help, please. You can just let's lay, live someone on the side of the road. They don't need help. They just die there. Death is only a beginning. Birth is only an ending. <laughs> so... Anyway, about Stanley Kubrick. So back at the time of, the, of 2001, he was, you know, I'm fairly convinced that he was having to do this whole cover-up of going to the moon of Apollo 11 before that, and then he was able to do his dream movie, 2001. But what was the dream movie? To find out what was going on. Are we seated here or not? And who is doing the seating? And who is that person? And is it us? a more advanced state, having had time travel, the, the time line being ruptured in some way or manipulated. And then further to that, um, you know, then he ultimately put the whole blame on eyes wide shut, the elites. Yes, they're the ones who hire you. They're the ones that control NASA. They control the government. And they hired him to do it. And he made a movie about going to the moon, which was untrue because you can see the plates that were shot and uh, the, the projector screen that was uh, where those plates were being projected to be the background. And you could see any, any film student could see where the actual texture of the, uh, the set ends and then the projector begins. And they called it the moon and it was fake. I don't, doesn't mean we didn't go to the moon. It just means that you know, that the footage they showed the public was not on the moon. And, you know, and um, the, the, the people that he worked for were tied in with Eyes Wide Shut. That was the whole point he was trying to make, and Eyes Wide Shut. It was very much part of the same thing he was trying to say in The Shining. The people who hired him were the people that were there at the Overlook Hotel. The elites who hired him for Apollo 11. If anyone talks about it, they get killed. And this was the whole point of the, of the Shining. It had nothing to do with the Stephen King novel. It had to do with his being able to confess the whole thing or put it out there and lay it out for future people to be able to see what had happened to him. And then finally, he just threw the, he just threw, he, he just in a kind of a Hail Mary pass, he finally just said, you know, it's these guys. And they worship Satan. Yes, they have their orgies and human sacrifice and dress up in costumes. It's just like what you would think. You know, and um, Clockwork Orange, the same thing. The oligarchs were running this program to rehabilitate criminals, but they were very much in charge of the society and they could conform people and force them to conform. 
And when they conformed a person, the person in the, in the form of Alex in Clockwork Orange was ruined as a human being and could not defend himself any longer. But he was no longer the wild, crazy human being. And then, and then on and on. He did all these films that ultimately, you know, kept looking at Dr. Strangelove was another great example. He kept looking at, um, you know, the powers that be in their nukes and, and making fun of them. And, but at the same time, it always had to do with these, these people at the top and behind the scenes who were very flawed and very um, messy, but being very dangerous and, and having, you know, impacting his life, certainly, and the lives of all of us. And making us miserable. And I think that was the message of a lot of his films, that these people that run the world make us all miserable. Hence, we're calling out to God, and a lot of people are looking at this hybrids, UFOs, you know, the, 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 these new movies, as, as a form of, you know, please give us relief. So I don't think that process is to be shunned in um, Prometheus and movies like that and sci-fi movies. I think rather um, we should applaud people, anybody, asking a question, why am I here? Why do I exist? I don't think that is a wrong question. Did aliens seed me here? And if so, why did they abandon me? And if they're coming back, are they going to help me feel better? Because I feel terrible. Is Jesus an alien? Is he just God? If so, then why did God put me here to feel miserable? And you know, grappling with these issues is a good thing. The church will tell you, stop grappling. You found your nirvana, so shut up. Well, they're wrong. They're, th not only are they wrong, but by their own definition, they're evil. Because they're tied in with the oligarchs and the elites. They might as well just dress up in satanic costumes and start killing people in the front of the altar every day. Why even go through the uh, exercise? Why do they kill people? Because they get an appetite for it, because it gives them power. I've given a lot of thought about these films, Kubrick's, Ridley Scott, sci-fi people in particular, always wondering what, what the deal is. I can't settle for the cloning bit. I can't settle for eternal life on my own terms through science, through transgenics. I know that all these these guys are all obsessed with and they write all their books about the Nephilim and everything and to me that's just a big yawn. I mean, that's just boring. It's like, well, tell me something I don't already know. At least I know I know it intuitively and I read about it. It's like, ah, tell me something. I don't want to know about the Anunnaki. I don't want to know about the, you know, the idea that there are these people in space or they're coming back or they're going to, you know, manipulate this and that. I don't care. What about my DNA and my misery? Tell me anything, but don't send another teacher. Don't send these, uh, Lynn Marzulli kind of people with their, you know, and their Tom Horns and whatnot within their Steve Quails and their dumb, you know, almost just inane garbage. Just boring is all get out because it doesn't impact me. It's like, look at me, look at me. I'm going to tell you everything. Look at me, look at me. And from a Christian, see, you don't go outside the rails. It's a Christian, otherwise it's new age. So listen to us and buy our books because we'll give it to you from a biblical perspective. You can take your Bible and shove it where the sun don't shine. You shouldn't even have a Bible. I, if I could do it, I'd take it away from you and, and make you forget. I put electrodes on your head and I make you forget that you ever saw the Bible or scripture so you wouldn't be able to to misquote it ever again. In your hands, it's poison. Okay. Um, I have to calm down because I guess what it is is I'm tired of uh, being jerked around by people, don't look at this, it's demonic, or listen to me over here, listen to me, that I've rejected pretty much all Christianity, except for my own little faith. And the faith I see in some people around me, you know, that, but in general, 
Yeah, I do have faith, and I do pray, and I do re- read the Bible. And I do want to be with God on this adventure, and I want to tell him, you know, what gives, what's up. And I want to know what's going on. And I don't want someone to tell me about the Anunnaki and the, and the what is it, the Nephilim and this and that, and they're returning and... I can tell you right now, they never left. <laughs> yeah, and then we can wonder about the Middle Earth and the, and the you know, the eat children. And, you know, we can go on and on and on like that and, um, and get nowhere. It's like the UFO thing. I can't stand the UFO thing because these people are just jerking each other off all day long and nobody is learning a damn thing about anything. The one real time I had... When I, and when I was seeking some answer, I went to, I didn't go to the Bible first, I went to MUFON. And they used to have a meeting out at the, uh, the pick, I'm sorry for my language there. I, I, I've, I've got to do something about that. I think I have to do something about the, I would have the Lord to take the anger away from me and the unforgiveness toward humanity. Because, you know, I think the Lord is, this is a big joke because he knows the one thing I can't stand is stupidity. It's just like, I can take someone being evil you know but stupidity I, I and then people going oh look how smart they are now that that is uh, where i go nuts stupidity as in we can beat god you know what i mean the elite stupidity is we can beat god <laughs> yeah, at least the fallen angels are smart i mean they were cut off they have no way back but these people did did have a way back and so it's you know Um, but I really can't stand, um, and I should be able to stand it because a lot of these people, like they're able to be in a religion, which is all about conformity, right? That's, they want you to conform to the culture and the ways and the mores of that religion. And that's why they induct you. And that's your oath that you take, that you're going to conform. Then they tell you, you're really beloved of God, but those out there aren't. And, you know, it goes on and on. I think we're all of us creatures of God, no matter what side we fell on. You know, I mean, he created the devil. He created the angels. He created the fallen angels. He created Satan. He created monsters. He created beautiful beings. He created, you know, planets and water and fish and stars and animals of all kinds and just a wonderful diversity of beautiful things. He created all these things. He created a story of light versus dark, of good versus evil, of, 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 of light winning over darkness in the end, in the final end, after, after suffering all the, the way. And then he told us about a new heaven, a new earth, and different things in the Bible. The Bible does not the end all and be all. It is not the end of the story. It's only, it's sketchy in places at times, especially in the book of Genesis and the book of Revelation, as to what is the purpose it, 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 it what will it be like being there so we're kind of left on our own to glean it from the scriptures and the scriptures just eventually fail in giving a forward vision of what it is that we need to be okay and there's a oh yes and there's a reason for that and the reason is if you knew that answer it's like the seven thunders screaming and if you knew that answer, you wouldn't do a damn thing after that. You just sit there. And, and I would too. <laughs> so that's why we don't get an answer, Mr. Moody Blues. Because we would not act. And God made us all. Satan's people, God's people, you know, whatever. It's all God's people. I mean, it's all God's thing. It's not Satan's thing. But we're all actors. We've taken our different sides and we have our different uh, spirits that are operating within us. And we go out and act. And it's a big battle. It's a knockdown, drag out fight. It's no fun at all. At the end of the day, my way is Jesus. My only answer is Jesus. The only place I can go is the Shekinah. I can jump in and become nothing, but I'm something and I'm loved and I'm um, home and then I'm expanding and then I'm something else. But anyway, as cryptic as that sounds, it's the only way I could put it that made any sense to me. So... You know, this is some kind of arrangement here that is not based on reality. 
that is not based on anything except like being in a game, if you will, a virtual game, and being tested for our faith in Jesus, whether we're going to give up that faith or not, which was the, the, the question of the film Prometheus, and whether or not we are going to... Um, see, within the rhema of God, or rhema, however you like to pronounce it, within the rhema of God, it doesn't conform to lines of Christian thought or anybody's thought. It just is going to go. It's going to be its ugly self. Or good self. It's going to, you know, it can come from anywhere. And at the same time, evil can come from anywhere as well. You know, like Rama is something that will give you um, hope and give you a kind of a new direction and help you to understand. To be at peace, you know, to be at peace. To finally just be at rest and be able to rest. That, you know, you've, you've got enough of an answer now that you can just, you know. And, and then, the, you know, the other extreme is don't ask any questions, which would be going against your nature and against the creation of God and against God, blaspheming God all the way. And um, just accept. He's got your back. You don't have any worries anymore. Um, no, everything I see disturbs me. And... Uh, I'm not at peace with any of it, and I'm going to find out the answer for it all. And I'm going to find out the answer to my existence or my dual or triple or infinite existence. And I'm going to find out why it's uh, multi-located. And I'm going to get those answers. I'm going to figure it out. And um, when I do, it won't be satisfying because it will be the answer I already knew, which is that any further out of the multiplicity, and then you have the, the status, state, static state of just consciousness kind of there and nothing moving and no actors. And so that becomes like, you know, like, ah, ah, that's what it's, there it is. There's the answer. And I know that's the answer. And I know that the whole search will lead to that. And I'm not really searching, but I'm, I guess I have another act I, I need to act in, which is um, the uh, beating the crap out of <laughs> the satanic kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, doing it from a supernatural position of uh, complete power. <laughs> and, of course, on that day, you know, but then, you know, will seeing them squirm make me um, happy? No. Will being filled with the Holy Ghost make me happy? Well, I'm happy. I'm not aware that I'm unhappy at that point. That's not an everyday thing. Being giddy drunk on the Holy Spirit, will that do it? No, that's a temporary thing. I mean, it'll give you uh, an absorption capability where you're just not thinking about your own problems, which I suppose is the whole point of Christ. What about just being of service to others and just being like Gandhi or Mother Teresa? Will that, no, that won't get you out of it either. Besides that, you know, you need, you know, God's made people to take and people to give. And, you know, there's... More blessed to give than receive? Absolutely. So if I could convey a message of comfort, it would be this. There is comfort in knowing. There is comfort in the question of why. There is discomfort in the avoidance because there's an anxiety that humans have. And the human being has this anxiety over existence and cannot exist in peace either with himself or his fellow man. And the reason is because the, 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 the suppression of the question and the conformity to the society that tells you everything is fine is obviously um, what, what they might call cognitive dissonance at best. It, it, there's a, there's a, there's a, a, you are agreeing to something you know isn't true, and so there's an anxiety within you that's going to act up, whether it be drugs or alcohol or some kind of sin. And, um, and, and or selfishness or, you know, um, you know, indulging in mental illness or whatever it is you're going to do. It's, it's, um, it's a thing that the Satan has tried to master over by being cool. You know, I'm cool. I got, it. I got that mastered, that whole thing. And what they really did is deaden themselves to the point where they don't feel it. So they can jump around and smile and do all those, you know, stupid smiles like the Obama and all that. 
when they don't mean it and, and crocodile tears and go through thinking they're getting somewhere playing this game and going from party to party and applause to applause and it's all meaningless. So the person that thinks that way is like, well, then I should kill myself. Is No, you don't have a self to kill. There's no self. You're no self. You are nothing. But there is comfort in the question. Asking questions, whether it be in a, in a secular way, meaning outside the Bible, or in a biblical way, meaning searching the scriptures for questions and, and you know, searching with, with a, a troubled heart. When you have a troubled heart, you have questions that are unanswered. That's all. And when you have comfort, you have an answer to your question. And then you're able to sleep at night. Then you're able to relax. And, you know, a lot of people will go into the Word to find answers to their questions is what will we become? Will going to be something different? There's going to be an answer to this suffering. There's going to be a reward after the suffering. One day you'll be taken care of. One day it's all going to be okay. One day there, you know, um, you know, God really does love you. You're not here on your own, just stuck on this planet unto death with no rhyme or reason. You have a reason for your existence and you're the only one that can be you. But you see, none of those answers that I just rattled off are good enough for me. I find comfort in the questions that go unanswered. Because you know what? I already know the answer to all the questions, and I don't want to know it. So I hide it from myself so I don't know it because it means stasis. You know, like a solid state of electricity. That means solid state, just like it sounds. There's, there's no mechanism that's generating that state. It's just, there it is, solid, you know. And um, we do anything we can to avoid that. So we don't want that as an answer, stasis. <sighs> we can't live in that. We need drama, a sense that we're going to overcome it. We're going to have our answer. We're going to fulfill our quest. We're going to go to the stars. We're going we're gonna to battle with the Nephilim. We're going to have this swashbuckling thing going on. And we've got a purpose to our lives. We're going to tell everyone about Jesus. We're going to evangelize the whole world. And, you know, we're going to become martyrs for the faith. And we're going to do all this stuff. It's all purposeful stuff we're to do. Because if you knew the answer, you wouldn't do anything. You would be immobilized. Ridley Scott would never have made that movie, either with James Cameron or the, the, the big daddy of them all, Stanley Kubrick, 2001. They wouldn't have made that movie unless they were, had questions that were bothering them. When a person doesn't have questions, they just sit there on the side of the road getting a little sun and, you know, hanging out. You can be an angel then, because angels have no questions. <laughs> Okay, well, end of solving the uh, riddle of the universe. Um, no, I don't find the movie blasphemous. Um, yes, I did find that I did a lot of thinking after watching it. Um, no, it didn't go against the of a faith uh, of, of a person. Yes, the person's on a quest to find out who she is and why she exists. Yes, it was well done and, and worth seeing. And uh, just about all the alarmist stuff about things we shouldn't see, I, I don't get it. But I am completely pretty much done. I mean, overdone with people that say, don't look at this, don't look at that. But listen to my YouTube channel and I'm going to explain the Nephilim or explain this or explain that. or I'm going to give you the end. I, I just can't do it anymore. I mean, it's OK that they're doing it because there's plenty of people that want to know that want to. But I've been delving into that since I was, you know, since the chariots of the gods. And it's a dry hole. The reason it's a dry hole is because there's no separation between me and God, between me and Christ. There's no separation. At the same time, I have to be an actor going through something. And the flesh doesn't work. That's horrible. You know, fulfilling fleshly desires and luxuries and things, that's, that doesn't do anything. That's just dissipation. With that, I bid you shalom, shalom, and uh, 
I hope you enjoyed this one, and I'll see you next time. God bless you.